tells me I want me to have extra time to preach, right? Amen. Okay, good. So as a good introduction real quick, I'm talking about cars anyway. Um, how many of you have ever been distracted when you're driving? Pretty much everybody? I can't. I can't. What? I said, how many of you have ever been distracted while you're driving? I have been distracted. I've been in cars with people that were distracted. Uh, one time I was in a car with this woman. She was driving, and she was an older lady, and a bee got in the car, and she started trying to swat this bee while she was driving. She was going all over the road. I thought for sure we were going to go off of it. But anyway, I was thinking about the importance of staying in your own lane. If you don't stay in your own lane, you know you know that people, when they made those roads, they painted a white line on this side, and they painted yellow lines in the middle right there. And the idea of it isn't to be mean to you, to say you have to stay in this spot. It's so that you don't get in an accident. So you don't run off the road. So you don't get hurt, right? That's what it's there for. Um, but I thought about how if you start crossing those lines, what happens, Lincoln? You get pulled over. You get pulled over. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just picking his name randomly for no reason there. But um, anyway, if you, if you start crossing those lines, somebody might see you crossing those lines. And they might think you're impaired somehow. They might think you've been drinking. They might think you're into drugs, something like that. And so they might call into the police and say, listen, this guy is crossing the line. Do you think they're doing that to be mean? No, they're doing that because they don't want somebody to get hurt. They don't want somebody to get injured. And so I was thinking about the lane that God has for us too. You know when God created man? God had a perfect trail lined out for your life. He had a wheel, and he said, I want you to go this way, and he put some boundaries there. He said, I'm going to put a boundary here, I'm going to put a boundary here, and if you stay safe within that lane, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to get in a wreck, you're not going to get hurt, you know. But you know, if you start to get out of that lane, you know, as a pastor, you know what my job is if I see you start to swerve and cross the line a little bit? My job is to be that concerned caller who calls the police and says, hey, listen, I see you going, I'm not going to call the real police. You know who I'm calling, right? I'm calling upon God. My job is to call upon God and say, God, that person seems like they're on a course that can injure themselves or injure somebody else. My job might be to come to you. You know, if I was riding with you and you were swerving, wouldn't it be my place to tell you, hey, we're going to get in a wreck. You need to kind of slow down a little bit and get the wheel under control, right? So if I see you going astray, shouldn't I be telling you if I see you going astray? And you should be telling me if I'm going astray. We should be doing that. Let's stay in the lane that God has given to us, right? And so I'm going to preach this morning on the idea of staying within the lines that God has painted for us. So let's pray first. Before we get in our Bibles, let's pray one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this place where we can come together and worship you. Father, I thank you for protecting Brother Simmons and Ben today when they were driving and that deer came out in front of them. I thank you, Lord, that even though a little bit of damage was done to their vehicle, that they weren't hurt, that they were able to continue driving and come here to have church with us. We thank you, Lord, for allowing each and every person to have time in their day and the health and the desire to be here in your house. Father, I'm praying that this message that you've given to us today will be helpful that each and every one of us can apply it to our hearts, apply it to our lives, and let it let it just kind of manifest itself in a way that we remember it all week, Father. It won't just be for this time period while we're here, but that we'll allow your word to change us, to transform us, Father, from the inside out. Lord, I want to pray and ask for your help now, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll tell you this before I get started. One more thing is that some messages, people have kind of come up with nicknames for what style of message it is. And I don't know here if I've ever used this style of message, but I'm going to call it a machine gun message. <laughs> what that means is a machine gun message is one where it's going to have a lot of bullets spraying out lots of different places from the Word of God. And just about everybody is going to feel something in there grab them. They're going to realize, here's an area where maybe I'm swerving across the line that God set for me. Here's an area where I'm going wrong. And so my idea is not to hurt anybody any more than if somebody, if you're going to take a driver's test and the instructor says, hey, get back over here. Hey, they're not trying to hurt you. They're trying to help you. They're trying to protect you. And that's what this message is doing. Even though it might feel like it hurts, even though it might be embarrassing to something, you know, if you feel like I'm messing up, the idea is to get you back on the road where you ought to be. So this past Thursday evening, I preached a message here on... How to know if an opportunity in front of you is an opportunity that God gave you or an opportunity you came up with with your own ideas or an opportunity the devil put in front of you, anything like that. 
And somewhere in that message, I shared Ephesians 5.17. That's where the Bible tells us not to be unwise, but to understand what the will of the Lord is. You know that's part of my job as a pastor, is to help you find out what the will of the Lord is. Not by sharing with you what my ideas of the will of the Lord is, but to share it based on the Word of God. To say, this is what God's will is, based upon His Word. You know, again, referring back to the driver's thing. If you're taking a driver's test, you have a manual you read before you ever go in there, right? So if by reading that manual, we should all agree. If you see two double yellow lines in the middle of the road, somebody tell me what that means. Don't pass. Don't pass. Don't, don't, pass. don't cross. If you, see a, if you see a solid line, but on the side toward you, there's a dashed line. What does that mean? You can pass, but the people coming the other way can't. So we're all in agreement. There's a right way and a wrong way to drive, right? So even if other people would tell you, no, those lines don't really matter, they do matter. And you're going to get in trouble if you don't stay within those. Well, when it comes to Christianity, God has painted some very clear boundaries. And there are people out there who say, no, those boundaries don't apply. But they do apply. And our job is to find out what those, ba- what those boundaries are and to stay within them. Um, so kind of trying to get us to where I can get into the message a little bit further, um, I want to tell you this. We're going to use a lot of scripture this afternoon. We have to. If I don't use a lot of scripture, it would just be my word, and my word doesn't mean anything. It's God's word that does. And so the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So that means all the Bible verses in the Bible are important. All of them. Amen. And so I want to take a minute on that, and then I will really dive into the message. I'm sorry for such a long introduction. But I feel like I have to do this because a couple of weeks ago, I had somebody that was in here, and they were talking after church to some folks, and they were saying that anything that the Apostle Paul wrote is not scriptures. Um, and so I need to address that really quickly. Because... I don't know how many people have heard that, how many people have heard those teachings or anything, and I want you to understand that when the Bible says all scriptures are given by inspiration of God, that means everything from Genesis through Revelation. When somebody says that the Apostle Paul's writings are not scripture, do you understand that he penned 13 books of the New Testament? We're living in the New Testament church age, so to try to discredit the majority of the New Testament by saying the I have a question. When we try to lead somebody to the Lord and show them how to be saved, most of us use Romans, don't we? We use Romans, and we talk about how the Bible says, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. From Romans, we know that um, the wages of sin is death. We know that the gift of salvation is only by God. From Romans, we know that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be saved. But if we're going to say that Paul's writings are not Scripture, how can we use that to show anybody how to be saved? It wouldn't make any sense to do that. So why is it that people would want to say, I don't believe that Paul's writings are scripture? I'll tell you why. What did the devil do back in the Garden of Eden after God told Adam, this is what trees you're allowed to eat of, but this is the tree you can't? Mm -hmm. The devil came along and he tried to cast doubt on God's word. The devil came along and he said, oh, that's not really what God meant. Well, now, today, Paul has, has said some things in the New Testament that some people don't like to hear. Paul said some things that some people say, I don't want to believe that. I don't want to believe the false teachers I shouldn't listen to. I don't want to believe that God has certain requirements as to what a marriage should be like. I don't want to believe that whatever. So I'm going to dismiss everything that Paul said. Well, that would be a problem. I'll tell you why. Because you can get in the Bible, you know, you don't have to guess if Paul's writing scripture or not. We, we don't have to debate, I think this, you think that. Right. Because in the Bible, the Peter actually told us Paul's writing for scripture. That's right. You know that? Amen. I want to show you that real quick. In case that person would pop up again in Hot Springs and tell any of you outside these church doors that, that Paul's writings are not scripture. I want you to have scripture you can share with them. So go with me to 2 Peter chapter number 3. 2 Peter, chapter number 3. I want you to see this with your own eyes. 2 Peter, chapter number 3. The page is still turning. In in verse number 10, where we're going to start, 
It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, so they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So if he said, he said, Timothy right here was saying what? He said about Paul's writings that yes. some people have trouble understanding Paul's writings. They're hard to understood. It says that they're, it's because people that are under, unlearned, they've not studied it out. They struggle to understand Paul's writings. And then he said, as they do also the other scriptures. So he said, Paul's words are scriptures, and so are the other Bible verses. He made that really clear. So if somebody comes and tells you only certain parts of the Bible are scriptures, that's a lie. All Bible verses are scriptures. Okay, so now that we have that understood, um, I want to talk more about the lane that God designed us to travel in. And so to do that, I'm going to mention a lot of verses throughout the Bible of things, and some of them you're going to say, yes, I'm doing that right. I'm right in the lane I'm supposed to be in that area. But in some areas you're going to say, no, I see where I messed up. So let me give you a quick, easy example. Especially since there's no kids in here, really nine little kids. Let's be an easy one. So in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, the Bible says to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it, right? So to stay in your lane as your parent, your job is to train your child. Today, a lot of parents get out of that lane. And they say, I want my child to make up their own mind. I, don't, I want my child to just figure out their own way in life, their own path in life. But God said the lane is to train up your child in the way he should go. Yeah. And that when he's old, he will not depart from it. So God set these boundaries. When a parent chooses not to obey God in that, and they don't train that child up in the way that they should go, then when that child gets older, he finds himself in a mess. Because the Bible tells you what way he should go, too. You don't have to guess which way he should go. Like, like for an example, the Bible tells you that it's good that a man not touch a woman. So you're until he's married. It's the idea of that. So you're training up your child, and you say to your young man there, as you're, you're raising him up, listen, God wants you to keep yourself pure until after you're mar married. If a parent trains their child that way, and that child grows up and they respect that, then that, that adult is never going to leave a child to grow up after mom and dad have went different ways, you know, they've been with several different people, and that child grows up, who's my dad? They're not going to create that problem. They're not going to create a problem of paying child support to a child here or to a mom over here when they've got another mom over here and a mom over here. They're not going to have that. They're not going to have an issue where they get with a lady and get another lady and get another lady and they get a disease. If they train that child up in the way he ought to go, that is not going to be a problem for him. If they train that child up in the way that he ought to go, they're going to teach him to obey the law. They're going to teach him, listen... When the government has a state has a law here, unless that law contradicts the word of God, you're to obey that. That child's not going to end up in jail. Now, I know there are people who say, you can raise your child up really strict, and you can give them these strict guidelines, and most of them, they're not going to obey it anyway. They're going to throw their life apart. But you know what? My wife and I were both raised with parents who said, you're to be raised up according to the word of God, and you're to keep, keep yourself pure. Guess what? I was 33 years old when I got married, and I was still pure. So was my wife, still pure. My wife and I, neither one, have ever smoked a cigarette, never drank a beer, never did we um, do drugs. We were raised in the same neighborhood. We were hours away from each other. You can be raised up that way. Yes, right. people train you up in the way you want to go. Yeah. Yeah. But neither one of us have had to spend time in jail. Neither one of us have had to be going through a lot of marital difficulties. 
We've not had those problems because people stayed in their lane and trained us up the way they ought to go. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, the Bible gives us another one. It says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So the Bible tells us to be careful of drinks that make us intoxicated, drinks that make us not think clearly, drinks that could cause us to hurt somebody else while we're driving a car, like we were talking about a while ago. You know, drinks that can impair us to the point where the next day we get up and we have no idea what we did the day before. If you stay in those lines God gave you, you're not going to have to go to some addictions class later on in life. You're not going to have people you love coming to you and say, hey, I'm worried about you. I'm worried that you're going to end up hurting yourself or hurting somebody else. I'm worried that about the influence you're having on your kids. You won't have to worry about that if you stay in the lines, stay in the lane that God gave us right there. We need to understand that God has some very strong lines set up. In James chapter 4, verse 4, this is hard for a lot of believers to grasp. The Bible says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You know what that means? Not only for when you're training up your kids, but also for you as an individual. If you try to be friends with people who are not godly, it's going to drag you down really quickly. I've thought about churches, what I've seen happen in churches over the years. Especially young people. That they'll be in church for a really long time. They'll be serving the Lord. They'll be doing the right thing. Until they make friends with somebody they shouldn't be. And they get themselves in trouble. Or they start dating somebody they shouldn't be. And they get themselves in trouble. Do you know what happens when we try to befriend the world? First of all, we tell ourselves, if I can befriend that lost person, I can get that lost person to get saved and live like me and I can help them straighten out their life. But there's a big problem with that. The first problem is the Bible says no. It says come ye away from them, come ye out from among them and be ye separate, right? So think about this as an illustration. If I have a little toddler and I'm getting ready to come to church and I'm outside and I see that little toddler walking over this big mud hole and they're looking over there at it and I'm looking and they're dressed up, they're ready to come into church and I say come over here away from that. Is my intention for them to go over there and kind of stick their feet in it? No. My intention is stay away from that. Come here over here and be separate. You be separate from that mud hole. Why? Because if that child says, watch this, I can get all the mud out of the mud hole. I can clean up that mud hole. Watch. And so they go over that mud hole and they start to put up the sand in that mud hole. They're going to have mud all over them. But guess what? The mud hole is still muddy. They didn't clean it up, did they? What happened is they convinced themselves, I can be friends with that mud hole and I can change the mud hole, but the mud hole changed them. I was thinking about how many young people, how many young people I've seen over the last five years that have tried this same game, tried this same game with people. I can befriend whoever I want to befriend and it's not going to hurt me. And they look around and they see, they see the, de the damage when other people do it and they say, I can't believe that person would hang out with that person. Do they not see what kind of problem that's going to cause and then you watch that person fall out of church. And then just a few months later, they're doing the exact same thing they saw somebody else did and finding a way to justify it. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. God said no. He said that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. That means it's against God. That means it's the opposite of everything God says. It's enmity with God. We know the Bible tells us in multiple passages of scriptures that we're not only to sing unto God, but we're to sing aloud, and we're to make a joyful noise unto God. Amen. So that means if you're going to stay in the lane that God has designed for you, when you come into the church house, you don't just sit there, and you don't just stand up and barely move your lips. Right. It means you sing aloud, Amen. because you're excited. You've got something to sing about, something to shout about, because you're serving the God of God, the Creator, the Savior, the Redeemer, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley. Amen. We've got a God to be singing to and singing aloud. To stay in that lane means you don't just come in and listen to other people sing. You say, I'm one of God's children. And I want to sing the way that God has called me to sing. Yeah. How about this? In 2 Timothy 
The Bible tells us that as soldiers in the Lord's army, we can't entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life. Otherwise, if we entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life, we'd be unable to serve God wholeheartedly. If we entangle ourselves, what does that mean to be entangled with the affairs of this life? It means if I go out there and I get myself so involved in something that it consumes me. I go out and get so involved in something that it now takes precedence in my life. Anything. No matter what it is, then I'm entangled in it. Think about if I go out there cutting grass. How many of you have ever been cutting grass and you run over something like a rope? Do you know what happens if you run over a rope and you're cutting grass? That blade on the bottom, it's all entangled. Up and it gets so wrapped up, it can no longer, that blade can't function the way it was supposed to be functioning. As long as that thing's entangled, it can't do what it was designed to do. Right. If I get entangled in the affairs of this life, I won't be free to do what God has told me to do. I will be hindered. I will be restricted. So he tells us very clearly that to stay in our lane, we cannot be entangled in the affairs of this life. We can't be. In Colossians chapter 1, verse number 18, the Bible instructs us that Christ is the head of the body, the church, and that he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that all things he should have preeminence. Yeah. That one, to stay in your lane, Christ has to have preeminence. Yeah. This is one of the things that I have struggled the most in trying to get people that I've pastored over the years to grab a hold of, is that Christ has preeminence. Yeah. Christ should be first and foremost. You should never get to the place in your life where you're sitting there and you're saying, well, I would disobey God in this area, but I know if I do, that pastor's going to call me out. I know that the Bible says this, but man, I mean, I could probably get away with it, but my spouse or my child or whoever, they would see me, and I, I don't want anybody to see. No, what about God? Amen. What about God? He has preeminence. Do you not care what God says? Is it only about what pleases somebody else? What about what he says? Amen. That's Amen. what should matter to us more than anything else. Amen. If we're staying in our lane, Christ has preeminence. Amen. That means... You know, we've seen it even here. We've seen, as small as this church is, we've seen it. You'll see somebody start coming to church, and they'll be faithful. They'll be here every time the door's open on Sunday afternoon, every time it's open on Thursday evening, and then sports start up, and now I've got to be gone for this sport. Then they'll start coming back again, and now another sport opens, and now I've got to go do this sport. Then they come back, and suddenly they can't go, because now they've got to teach somebody else something. Always something else. I'll come to church as long as this isn't going on in my life. If this is here, this has preeminence. But if this isn't here, I'll be in church. The Bible says, if you want to be in those lanes, you want to be in the lane God gave you, Christ must have preeminence Amen. at all times. Amen. Christ must always have preeminence or you're starting to swerve all over the place. You're getting out of your lane. Matthew 6.33 says, To seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The things that we want in life, the things that we want out of life, we're supposed to seek God first and let God take care of those things. Yeah. Whatever our needs might be, if we seek God, God will give us what we need. We just have to put our full faith and our full trust in Him. Yeah. So the lines that God painted along the sides of the lane He wants us to be in, He painted those things with scriptures. So He placed some scriptural boundaries around us to help us on our journey through this cold and dark world that we're in. And He tells us that in Psalm 119 and 105. He says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So that means for us to know where our lane is, we've got to spend a lot of time in the Word of God. Not just a little bit. It means that you can't just have what the Word of God is that the pastor preaches to you when you're here. You've got to have the Word of God that you get at home. When you open up the book and you read it for yourself, because I hate to tell you, there's a lot of false teachers out there. A lot of people making mistakes. Don't put your confidence in man. Put your confidence in the Word of God. Get in that book and read it and let it be a light into your path. Um, turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13 real quick. I'm not going to have you turn, to, turn everywhere because you'd be flipping all day. But go to Romans chapter number 13. This one has several different things in it that all have to do with authority. But I want to show you this as far as the lanes go because authority is an area where a lot of people struggle. People of all ages struggle. Romans chapter number 13. If I haven't, if my machine gun hasn't got you yet, I probably will with this chapter. <laughs> Romans chapter 13, verse number 1. 
The Bible says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Let me read the next verse and I'll stop for a second. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. Do you know one of the hardest things for, for us to train kids up in the way they should go is when a parent is telling a child, listen, the Bible says right here, you've got to obey your parents. You've got to honor your parents because your parents are your authority figure. But then that parent goes down the road and they see a law that says, speed limit of 70 miles an hour, I'm going to go 80 miles an hour. And that kid looks at their parents and they say, now wait a minute. Whether they say it out loud or just in their mind, why is it that you get to choose how fast you go when the Bible says you're supposed to obey the, the laws of the land? The Bible says you're supposed to submit to the higher powers. Why is it that you expect me to submit to you, but you don't submit to the higher powers? When kids sit there and they, they see, whether they're your kids or somebody else's kids, teenagers, whatever it might be, and they see that there's laws out there that you're choosing to ignore, but yet you're telling them they should obey certain laws, you're swerving off the road. You're messing up your kids, and you're messing up other people's kids. And it's a shame. We need to learn to stay in our lane. Why does God put people in power? He said there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. If their rules don't contradict the Bible, we're supposed to abide by it. Yeah. Even if we don't like it. Even if it's not convenient. That's what the Bible says. To stay in your lane means you obey the ordinances of man. It means you obey the laws of man as long as it does not go against what the Word of God tells us. So what I mean by that is if they pass a law tomorrow... And they say, there's no more assembling together as a church. That would contradict scripture, because it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. So, like when COVID-19 happened, uh, we didn't have this church started yet. We had the one in Superior. And so that one was going, and I said, no, we're going to continue having church. I don't care what the governor says. The Bible says we're not going to forsake the assembling. So we continue to assemble. Um, there are times when you have to say, government, you're wrong, you're going against the word of God. But if it's not going against the Word of God, it's just for our convenience, just for our preference, just because we don't like what they're saying. Mm -hmm. We are commanded by Scripture to stay in our lane yeah. and to not try to take that on ourselves and do whatever it is that we want to do. That's why it goes on in verse number 6. And it says, For this cause pay ye tribute also, that's taxes. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth, sorry, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Loving your neighbor doesn't mean turning a blind eye to all the wrong things your neighbor does. If I had somebody in my car and I was trying to teach them how to drive, and they were just all over the place, would I be loving them very much just to let them be all over the place? I wouldn't be loving them very much. If I got in the car with somebody and they had been drinking, and I didn't know what I got in the car, I see these beer cans in there, I smell the beer on their breath, I see that they're not stable, I wouldn't be loving them very much if I just allowed them to continue driving that way. Because I've seen the results of people driving that way. If I love them, if I love my neighbor as myself, then I'm going to try to stop my neighbor from doing things that will hurt my neighbor or hurt other people. I'm going to do that because I love them, not because I hate them. I'm not just going to go along with them. And if I get in the car with them and they start going down through there and they've been drinking, I say, hey, hey, 
You need to stop the car. You should not be drinking. And they, they start explaining to me how they're still sober and they've got a really long tolerance and they talk to me for an hour about how, how safe they are. If I love them, I don't change my mind just because they can, they can talk the bark off a tree. I still stand my ground and say, no, you're drunk. You should not be driving. I don't care how much convincing you're trying to do. Right is right and wrong is wrong. That's how you love people. We need to get a hold of what the Bible is saying here. Speaking of authority, another one, if I haven't hit you yet, maybe this one. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 says this. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So in that verse, it's saying that for a wife to stay in her lane, she has to submit to her husband. That is not popular in today's society. Right. People don't like that, and it causes more arguments and more fights in homes than anything else when people won't stay in their lane. God said there can't be two heads of a house. It's not going to work. Have you ever seen a snake even with two heads? So you know one on one end and one on the other. It's not going to work. This is going to be trying to go that way. This is going to be trying to go that way. They're going to split in two. So God created an order, and he said the husband is subject to God. So God is the ultimate head. Then the man submits to God, and then the wife submits to the dad, or the husband, and then the kids submit to both the mom and the dad. He said there's a certain order of the way that things have to go here. And if you don't do that, you get out of line. You get out of order, and you're swerving, and you're going to have an accident. You're going to ruin your life. It'll happen over and over and over again if you get out of that lane. We need to get a hold of this. Also, with women. I'll get to men in a minute. But um, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, the Bible says a woman is to learn in silence with all subjection, that she's not to teach or to assert authority over a man, but to be in silence. Likewise, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34, it more specifically says, Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it's not permitted unto them to speak, but they're commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now, why does it say that? The person that I told you that came in and was trying to teach things after church recently was a woman. It was a woman who was being deceived, who did not understand the Word of God. The Bible told her not to teach. That doesn't only mean that she doesn't come behind the pulpit and teach. It means she doesn't teach down there either. It means she doesn't teach out back. It means she doesn't teach there. Does that mean a woman can never teach anything? No. You've got to read the rest of the scriptures. Because the Bible does say that there is an area where women can teach. And it's in Titus. Let me show you that one real quick. Go to Titus chapter 2. There is an area where God does want women to teach. But it's not the way that some women think they should be teaching. God gives different roles for different people. Titus chapter 2, verse number 1. This is the only place in the Bible where it talks about what a woman can teach people. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard... Uh, am I in the right place? I don't know. You said Titus chapter 2. Oh, wait a minute. Where did I go? Did I go to the wrong place? I did go to the wrong place. You're right. Sorry, I'm in 2 Timothy and I did say Titus. Thank you. Titus chapter 2. I heard somebody say what? Thank you. All right, I'm reading the wrong place. I told you, don't put your trust in man. Man can make mistakes, right? <laughs> Titus chapter number 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So what the Bible says a woman teaches, as a woman teaches older women, teach younger women, how to be the right kind of a lady in their home. She teaches them how, how to get along with her husband. How to train up her children the way they ought to go. How to be a helpmate. How to have the right kind of a spirit. It does not say anything in here about a woman teaching doctrine. It doesn't say anything in here about a woman teaching that. A woman's place to teach is to teach other women how to be feminine. And there's a lack of that in America. 
there's a lack of women that know what it's like to be feminine because there's not enough older women that are feminine to teach it. To teach, listen, God designed you to be beautiful. God designed you to have a very special place as a keeper of the home. God designed you to do some special things in parenting and being a mother. God, he wants you to be this. He wants you to be like this virtuous woman. That's part of what an older woman is to teach a younger woman. But when we get out of line, when we get out of that lane, it causes a lot of confusion. It causes a lot of turmoil. And so we've got to be careful to do what the Bible says and not just do what we think should be right. Again, everything that I have preached so far, I've given you scripture for. I've not taken anything out of context. I've shown it all directly from the Word of God. So if you get offended, it's because you don't like the Bible. It's not because you don't like me. I mentioned this verse a while ago, but in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, the Bible says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long upon the earth. So when the Bible says children obey your parents in the Lord, we live in a society where a lot of kids get way off that boundary all the time. Where a lot of kids are basically running their households. They're demanding things. And, and parents are giving in because kids are yelling and screaming and demanding and wanting whatever it might be. That is not the way the Bible says things ought to be. It says they're to obey their parents in the Lord. We see a lot of this. There's a lot of mixed families anymore. By that, what I mean by mixed, and not about racially mixed, I'm talking about where somebody is raising a their grandchild, or somebody is raising a child they adopted. Somebody's raising whatever, a child that wasn't theirs biologically. And so the child that they're raising, they, they go to that person when they have a need. They'll go to them, hey, can you give me this? Can you buy me this? Can you take me here? Can you take me there? They see them as their guardian and as their parent. But when that person that's raising them says, no, you should not do this, they say, well, that's not really my parents, so it doesn't matter what they say. They're supposed to obey their guardians. It's the people just watching over them, the people caring for them, the people training them up. And it says that you're supposed to do that because it's right, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long upon the earth. Stay in your lane. We need to get a hold of this. We need to teach others how to stay in their lane. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, the Bible says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. That's like an employee-employer relationship. I'm sure if you've worked very long, you've worked for some good bosses and some bad bosses. I know that I have. I've worked for some bosses who are very easy to work for, and I've worked for some bosses that I really would not want to work for ever again in my life. But the Bible says no matter what kind of boss it is, that we, as God's people, are supposed to subject ourselves to them with fear. Not only to the good and gentle, it says, but also to the froward. We're supposed to subject ourselves to them, submit to them. That means if you're subjecting yourself to them, it's not an idea of I'm going to obey them while they're looking at me, and as soon as they turn their back, I'm going to go back by them and go tell everybody else how horrible they are or what I don't like about them. It means I subject myself to them completely. That's how you stay in your lane. I thought, I'm thinking right now, the job that I had a long time ago, there was a woman that worked there that she did not stay in her lane very well that way. And what she did is, including me, she got several of us to quit that company over the years because I was foolish. I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. And I listened to her a lot. But this woman, what, what she would do is she would sit there and do the work that needed done. But as soon as the boss left the room... She would start whispering and complaining about how this is not very fair. They should be paying us more money for the work that we're doing. Why are they not making this person do that and they're making this person do that? This woman would go so far as to tell us that she was trying to find another job and she would even tell us about the good jobs that were open in the area. And so you're going out applying for another job because she is too and you're all going to leave together. But person after person left that place and she stayed right there working. You know what it was? Is she was getting out of the lane. She was. Now, by the way, that company is no longer in business. I looked them up a while back. And they're no longer even in business. That lady probably has a lot to do with why they're not. She was running everybody out one at a time. And the employer didn't see it. Supervisors didn't see what was going on. But that lady had no idea what it meant to subject to those, to be in submission to those that had to rule over them. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have to rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. 
For that's unprofitable for you. That verse is talking more about spiritual leaders. Amen. That's why it's talking there about, um, it, it says for they watch for your souls. It's talking about a spiritual leader. Talking about a pastor. Talking about a Sunday school teacher. Yeah. Talking about somebody who is trying to teach you the word of God. And it's talking about that that person, that again, you need to obey those that have the rule over you. So in any job, let me say this. If you work in any job that has 20 or more people, there's going to be more than one boss in, in that place, isn't there? You're going to have a boss that's up here, a boss that's down here, a boss that's down here. So you're supposed to submit to all three of those bosses. But if things are getting out of order and those three bosses are disagreeing, they're telling you different things, who are you supposed to obey? The top boss, right? The big boss. That's yeah. the ruler. The ruler is the one that I'm supposed to be listening to. The overall ruler. If the other ones are disagreeing, then if there's a problem, it, this one up here is the one you've got to submit to. And that's hard sometimes to understand that. But we as God's people need to figure that out. And to stay in our lane, it also means this. It means if you're in that company, you've got two or three different levels of employers. You know, um... Let's say where my wife works. My wife's a manager. She's got a CNO above her. There's like um, nurse managers down beneath her. If my wife decides when she goes into work tomorrow that she's going to start making decisions her CNO is supposed to start making. She starts going around on the floor and telling people, I know that the CNO said this, but this makes more sense to me. Start doing it this way. That means my wife would be getting out of her lane, doesn't it? Especially because she wouldn't be telling the CNO she's doing that. She'd be doing that on her own, of her own accord, sneaking around behind the scenes and acting like she's the CNO when she's not. The other people that are there would need to recognize that and say, I'm not going to do that. You're not the ruler. The ruler is this person. I'm going to submit to it. So it's both those in charge that have to learn to be in the right lane and it's those that submit that have to learn to be in the right lane. If we get everything out of whack, we're going to have a mess. And that happens in homes, that happens in schools, that happens in churches, that happens in everywhere you go. We've got to learn how to stay in our right lane. I'll move one more, and I'll stop. I don't want to keep get all of you mad at me. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 13. The Bible says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly for their work's sake, and be at peace amongst yourselves. So that verse is also similar to the one we read a minute ago, but it has a word in it, admonish. But I don't think a lot of people know what it means. The word admonish has to do with the idea of warning you or notifying you of a fault. And so what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is you're to know those that labor among you and that are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So that means when your spiritual leader tells you, listen, what you're doing is not in alignment with this. Our job is to recognize that spiritual leader, to recognize and appreciate that, appreciate their warning, their notification of the fault, and to esteem them very highly, the Bible says, for their work's sake. Do you know the number one reason that people leave churches, as far as churches I've been in anyway, is when a pastor is admonishing people in the church. When, whether it's done by him preaching and people don't like what's being preached, or whether it's being somewhere outside of church and he's talking to them through a phone, through a text, through an email, meeting in an office, whatever it might be, when a pastor begins to tell somebody, the Bible says this is the direction you should go. But they are determined to go in another direction. A wedge begins to be built between the spiritual leader and the person who's supposed to submit. And there becomes a lot of contention between the two. The Bible says only by pride comes contention. If the person who is supposed to submit to the other person does it, there's never going to be contention. Ever. My wife and I never have contention in our home. I, I don't think there's been contention between us in years. Why is that? Because she understands her role, I understand my role. There's not contention there. Where there is contention is when there's people that don't understand what their role is or they don't appreciate their role or they want to be in a different role they get out of their lane and it causes contention and it causes, it causes heartache and it causes grief and hard feelings. It causes people to go different directions. What I'm saying to you today is this. God has very clearly made a way for you to drive, for you to journey through this life because we that are Christians, we're not going to stay on this earth forever and ever and ever. We're going to be here for a short little while. It's like we're pilgrims passing through. And God said, as you're going from here to where you're going, 
I've got a way where you can drive, where you can stay in the lines and stay safe and everything will go smoothly. And it'll stay really smooth if you stay within these lines. And I didn't hit all the lines today. I just hit some of them. I didn't even hit probably a hundredth of them. But anyway, what we need to understand is any area where we swerve away from what the Bible says is putting us in danger. Every time we're doing that, we don't know. You know, if you're driving on the road, if you're lucky, if you swerve across the lane, somebody might just call the police and say, I think this is an impaired driver. If you're not very fortunate and you cross a lane, somebody else is going to come and hit you head on and you're going to die. Or they're going to die. You don't know when you swerve and you cross a line if it's going to be the last mistake that you make as far as God goes. You don't know, you know, like if you were driving that physical car and you crossed the line, you could live, but you could cripple some little kid for the rest of their life by crossing the line. It's serious. Do you realize the same thing happens with young people today? That some people in a church will make a decision or do something that's ungodly, something that doesn't align with the Bible, get out of their lane, and they'll hurt a kid, and they'll follow them the rest of their life. In Superior, our pastor there, long as I'm here, our pastor in both churches, you guys know that. But in that town in particular, you'd be amazed how many young people that have been invited to come to Lighthouse and their parents will say, back when I was a little kid, I used to live somewhere else and I went to a church and somebody did this and it was so ungodly, they did that and it was so ungodly, and I will never let my kids go to church because of that. Because somebody, somewhere, swerved out of their way, out of their line, it hurt another family so bad that not only did that person not go to church, but their wife not going to church, their kids aren't going to church, and more than likely their grandkids aren't going to go to church. They're not going to hear the word of God because somebody got out of their lane. We need to take the word of God serious. We need to get in it, figure out what those lines are, figure out what God wants us to do because it's, he gives us a free will. He gives us a free will to choose whether or not to stay in that lane. It's just like, when, you, again, that car. When you get in the car, you got the lines there, but nothing is forcing you to stay in those lines, is it? Nothing's forcing you to. They say, here's the boundaries. It's what you need to do. You can cross those boundaries all you want to. But if a cop pulls you over and he says, I'm going to write you a ticket for $200, and you say, I think you should let me off in the morning, you don't get to decide that. The cop does. The same thing is true with God. When you swerve and you go outside of his will, you go outside of what the Word of God says, God is going to decide what your consequence is. And you can say, well, God, I think it should be this. And he's going to say, you don't get to decide that. You chose to disobey me. I choose what mode of correction to use. I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible and I see some of the types of correction that God gave to people and they got outside of his will, I don't want to mess with God. I know what he's capable of doing. And for me, it's a very serious matter to get in this Word and study it out and find out what His will is and to stay inside of those lanes. The Bible says we got saved by faith, right? We got saved by grace through faith. And we're saved unto what? Good works. Unto good works. Good works will be those works that align with the Word of God. Not works that go outside the Word of God. Not works that make us try to find a loophole to figure out how we can get away with something. We need to stay clearly and clearly marked boundaries. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you today again for this time to pray. Lord, I pray that this message will be received correctly by your people. I know that the devil likes to fight. He likes to use messages like this to try to divide and try to conquer. And Father, I'm praying that folks will decide that your word is more important than their own thoughts, their own feelings, their own beliefs. I ask you, Father, to help us allow your word, your word to show us what our beliefs ought to be. Help us to be in alignment with you completely. Help us, Lord, to get over ourselves and just to allow you to be in control of everything. Father, I'm praying that you keep everybody safe as they go to separate ways. I pray that this message might weigh heavy on hearts throughout the week as far as not, not to tear people down, not to pull them down, but in a way that encourages them to be more holy, in a way that encourages them to be more of what you have them to be. Father, I pray that you help this church as a whole. I pray that you be with every individual here, myself included, and help us, Lord, to be more in alignment with you. In Jesus' name we pray.